But again, just wanted to thank you for coming. We appreciate you being here. Um, the chief and his officers are going to do a presentation, and then after that, we'll have a question and answer session. So um, if you have questions, sit tight, hold on to them. We'll try to get to as many as possible. So, and still try to get everybody out of here by 7.30. So thank you all for coming this evening. Good afternoon. Chief Sales, City of Boyd Police Department. Uh, thank you all for coming out today. Uh, first, I would like to recognize a few people that we have as, uh, in attendance here. We have State Representative Mark Spreiser here. Uh, we have City Council for Gina Dahmer. We have a couple from our Rock County DA's office. Uh, new ones that's going to be assisting us and helping us out with some crime uh, here in the City of Boyd. Uh, we have City Manager Laura Luther in the back here. Um, I see Nancy, Nancy right there. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. I didn't see you now. Yeah. Nancy Corbeck also with the uh, city council. We have a retired firefighter there. All right, so we're going to get going. Um, like I said, my name is Chief Andre Sale. I have a couple of my command staff here with me today. Um, I'll allow them to introduce themselves. Uh, we're all adults, so I don't want to be that person that's trying to speak for them. Hi, Captain Dan Mullen, and I'm from the Science Administration. Tom Stingler, uh, Administration. Alright, so our first uh, presentation here is going to be talking about the violent crime in the city of Lloyd and our police department response to that. Some of the things that we're going to be doing for our police department, some of the things that we've created to assist uh, with identifying the individuals that commit the most violent crimes in our city. Yeah. Some of the directed patrol that we're going to be doing, some of the quote unquote new toys that we're going to be implementing to assist us with that. So, our meeting agenda we already had our welcome. We're going to review our vision, mission, and value statement. We talk about our private crime, our collaborative response plan, and then we're going to take a QA at the end. So the mission of the uh, vision and the mission of the Boys Who Respond. The vision is a community free of crime built on trust in you. One of the biggest things about me is ever since I started here almost 18 years ago is is community connection with you all. But that, that is something that is near and dear to me because without you all, sometimes we cannot solve the crimes that are going on in the city of Boyd. If you ever looked at it, you looked at uh, Sir Robert Hill, one of the big things he talks about is the police, uh, people are the police, the police are the people. No, no, no. Right. So like I said, one of the biggest things is community policing for me. Uh, Sir Robert Peel, the people are the police and the police are the people. That's one of the biggest things that we need to understand and we need to have that connection with each other. One of the biggest things is, you know, sometimes individuals have that conversation or that, that thought process that they don't need to snitch or they don't want to talk to the police. It's something that we need to get rid of within our community because we all have loved ones that are going to be victims to this crime that's going on in our city and also throughout the country. If you look at over the last two years through COVID, I think violent crime has reached up to 31% throughout the country and it's at about 28-29% here in the city of Boyd with the violent crime, especially with the shootings and the things that's going on in our country. And it takes us as a community to stop that. The mission of the Boyd Police Department is to create safe neighborhoods by reducing crime, fear, and disorder through community collaboration using honorable and progressive policing. It's one of the biggest things that we're going to talk about today is our community collaboration. Our officers are going to be officers that's going to be going out on foot throughout our community, talking to you all, introducing themselves by a first name basis. That's something I do, and that's something that we all should be doing. We need to get to know each other. So our officers are going to be doing that this summer, this spring, getting to know you, knocking on your doors, introducing themselves. They work those neighborhoods. They want to know who you are. We're going to reduce the fear in our city by doing that directed patrol, identifying the individuals that's creating the uh, problems in the city of Lloyd and let it be known to them that we are going to be targeting them and specific directed patrol are going to be at those individuals and we're going to work with our Rock County DA's office to make sure that they are going to, uh, to jail. Um, if you were going to be having face-to-face -face meetings with people, you wouldn't have any advance notice? Yes, yep. There's a couple of dates that we're going to be having out throughout the summer that we will get out to everyone in advance. 
I want to be sure to have enough donuts. <laughs> you like bagels too. Yeah. <laughs> um, use an honorable policing. Um, if you look at some of our hiring practices, we have identified great individuals that want to be police officers to actually protect and serve our community. Not just having a job, being a police officer, wearing a badge, taking pictures on it and posting it on social media. We want people that truly believe in the community policing concept. And actually we have three of our uh, academy recruits in the back. I want to identify them because they're all pretty much shy and they probably put the head off and run off the, uh, the sunset. But those are going to be three great officers that we have. We have three other ones that's in the police academy now. Um, they're going to be great officers for our police department. And then we're going to be using progressive policing uh, within our police department, intelligent-led things. Things that um, we're going to be working with the Rockford Police Department, Winnebago County, Illinois Police Department, Janesville, Rock County, all the way up to Madison, making that connection with them. Just because if you look at the way crime is now, it's based through social media. A lot of these kids know each other. Uh, there's something that we did back in January, February, where we had a lot of um, vehicle thefts within the Rock County area, Winnebago County, and the Dane County area. We were able to connect with those agencies, and we shared approximately 700 to about 800 names of individuals that were involved in criminal activity through Rockford all the way up to Madison. <laughs> so that's that connection that we're building with other agencies to make sure that we are being good stewards to our people and our community. I'll go through this briefly. Um, our value that the Bullet Police Department is to be guardians. Um, we can break that down in acronyms here. It's our guardianship. Uh, we will guard, protect, and preserve all life and property in the uh, Bullet community as well as each other. Unity, where our individuals work as a team in partnership with our community to achieve common goals. We're adaptable. We adjust and embrace change for the uh, continued success of the Bullet community and our organizational needs. Respect, we have uh, value, we have mutual respect for the community and each other. We're dedicated, we are devoted to each other and dedicated to serve the public through progressive community policing. We have integrity, we believe that integrity is the foundation to enhance trust between each other and the community to build strong partnerships. Accountable, we are responsible to each other and the community to ensure ethical leadership in all levels of the organization. Noble, we are privileged to serve a proud community through a profession with high ideals and strong moral character and the sacrifice. We are willing to take responsible, responsible risk by putting others before ourselves in the effort to keep the community safe. These are some of our pictures that our uh, police officers have done throughout the years. One of the good things that we created uh, over a couple of years ago was our bike patrol program. We've seen a situation where a lot of kids were, uh, I don't want to call it reckless, but riding around on their bikes in the neighborhoods, not wearing the proper uh, equipment to make sure that they're safe. Uh, we were lucky enough to uh, receive some uh, funds to uh, have bikes donated to us. We developed our bike patrol program, and they did a lot of great things. One of the bike rodeos, teaching kids how to safely ride their bikes, and then also being involved in the summertime with some of the longer bike rides uh, that went out throughout the city. So now we get into uh, some of our uh, violent crime statistics, uh, some of the things that I know that you're all here for, so we can talk about that and understand what's really going on in the city uh, of Deloitte. So Inspector Stigler is going to uh, team up with this one on me. We're going to talk about our, our violent crime. If you look at the statistics uh, here, so we went back to 2020 when uh, COVID started and in 2021. If you can't see it, I'll move off to the side. Everybody can see it. 2020, uh, we had 120 aggravated assaults. Inspector Stigler is one of them. Yeah, so an aggravated assault is a classification of a crime uh, that we report to the state of Wisconsin, who then transfers the information to the federal government through the Uniform Crime Reporting System. So. A crime that meets the definition of an aggravated assault is what you're seeing up there. Now, if you're like most people, when I talk to my mom, she thinks of an aggravated assault as somebody with a knife cut somebody or somebody smashed a bottle over somebody's head. It was pretty aggravated, right? But that's not really the case. If you and I are playing cards and you really irritate me and I pick up an ashtray and say, hey, you son of a gun, 
you know, you're cheating, put the money back on, and then he calls the police, that's an aggravated assault. If I threaten somebody with a weapon, that's an aggravated assault. We weren't really catching those in the previous years, but last year we, we noticed that there was a, a reporting problem within the agency where we weren't really counting all of those, what we call disorderly conducts, where the threat of a weapon is there. But since it meets the definition that the federal government requires, we report those. So out of that, 158 aggravated assaults, there's a large percentage of them that are domestic violence and that are what we would consider disorderly conduct with the threat of a weapon. A very, very small percentage of those are what I consider a true aggravated assault and what I think most people think is a true aggravated assault where there's a bar fight and somebody gets hit over the head with a pool cue and their head split open or um, something of a similar nature or, or a really serious, um, kind of serious, but a domestic that results in a serious injury. Those are actually make up a very small percentage of those uh, 158 incidents. So I don't want you to be alarmed by that. Does anybody have any questions on that? <laughs> yes. I can't hear you. Should the question is, do we track aggravated assaults that result in injury? We could, yes, but we don't have it here today. Um, but I think the, the vast majority of those aggravated assaults, there is no injury. There's just the threat of an injury or the threat of a weapon, and that's what counts as an aggravated assault. Um, the robberies, I can comment on those. Um, we had a decrease in robberies. I think that's because of the, the pandemic. There wasn't as many stores open. There wasn't as many people open. People out and about. Um, most of our robberies are not what we had happen um, yesterday, which is a holdup of a financial institution. Most of our robberies are two guys who know each other and they're walking down the street and they get into an argument and somebody says, you know, give me that 20 bucks you owe me. And then there's a, an, a, an altercation and somebody gets take something from somebody else by force. It's not a random person walking down the street. We have very, very few of those random robberies um, that you hear about so often. Um, burglaries, we also saw a significant decrease in burglaries from uh, 2020 to 2021. Um, and I really don't have an explanation for that. We haven't dug into those numbers a whole lot. But I think it's a very significant decrease. Can you so, explain the difference between a robbery and a burglary? Yes, a robbery is a what we call a person crime. So I take something from you. That's a robbery. If I take something from your property, um, if it has four walls, a door, and a roof, whether that be a trailer, um, a railroad car, uh, a garage, um, an apartment, a storage facility, anything like that, uh, somebody goes, enters that property unlawfully and takes property or has the intention of committing a crime, no matter what that crime is, that's a burglary. Another question? Yes. What's theft? <clears throat> theft would be um, where you don't enter a premise, and you don't take something from another person. So any other theft. So if you um, go into your local uh, store and shoplift, that's theft or larceny is what the um, FBI classifies it as, larceny. Does that make sense? Or if um, you leave your purse on the uh, counter at down the hall in the cafeteria here at the school and you come back from class and, the, and your purse is gone, that's a theft. It wasn't taken from your person. I will um, introduce Jillian Peterson. She's our Director of Support Services and Jillian every month, stand up Jillian. Uh, she works on these numbers, so she is very uh, intimately involved in these numbers. She understands the coding of these and she can talk more about some of the codings. 
just to think back on what he said in regards to that, the person has permission to be at that location compared to the burglary where they aren't lawfully supposed to be there. Compared to breaking in, compared to if I'm a friend of yours and you invite me into your home and then I take something, that would be considered a theft. But that helps. And then the other thing I want to comment on is the clearances. <clears throat> There's uh, very strict guidelines that um, say when we can clear a crime. Generally, the vast majority of police departments across the country, including the Beloit Police Department, we clear a crime when we make an arrest. So that's why the aggravated assaults have such a high clearance rate. Because remember what I told you, most of our aggravated assaults are people that are known to each other and they assault each other for whether it's a domestic or during a poker game or during a barbecue or what have you. <clears throat> and that's why the clearance rate is over 70%. Because somebody can tell us, my good friend and I got in an argument and you know he went crazy and assaulted me. Uh, that's what the majority of our arrests are like. Um, the only other way you can clear crimes is um, if the person is incarcerated, like in another state. We know where the suspect is, but we can't just we can't get our hands on him. So if, if the suspect committed a crime in Illinois and he's locked up down there and he's not going to get out for the rest of his life. We can't go arrest him, they're not going to release him, so we clear the crime, what's called exceptional circumstances, and we clear it that way. So, any questions on clearances? Yes? So, okay, you arrest the person, what happens then? They get slapped on the wrist and they go back and do it again? Well, we just have to have somebody here from the prosecutor's office. <laughs> okay. No, um, we have a very good relationship with the Rock County District Attorney's Office. Um, there's a lot that goes into charging decisions, a lot of, of various factors. It's, you know, the, the seriousness of the crime, the, um, the damage to the community, the threat to the community, what's the recidivism likelihood, um, and, and what are the needs of the perpetrator to make sure that he doesn't do this again. Um, in the pandemic time period, there was a lot of people that were, I think what you're thinking of, that were released on bail or maybe no bail because of the pandemic. We weren't holding people in custody. Um, but they are being held accountable as things make their way through the pipeline now that the pandemic is, is slowing down or hopefully almost over. So we, we arrest people, we don't charge people. The police, that's a big misnomer, you see that on TV, we don't charge people. We arrest them on criminal charges, we refer them to the district attorney's office and they make a charging decision. They're, when we make an arrest, it's based upon probable cause, which means you probably committed a crime. They have a much higher standard that they have to meet before they charge somebody. So it's our job to gather the evidence an impartial investigation that hopefully shows that the person we arrested committed the crime, and then they make a charging decision based upon that, and then it makes its way through the whole criminal justice system. Any other questions for me? Yes? An aggravated assault. Aggravated assault? Yeah. And you said that it means that somebody could threaten you, and that's aggravated assault? If I threaten you with a weapon, and a weapon could be a gun, a knife, an ashtray. Um, a child at a school picks up a pencil and threatens their teacher, I'm going to stab you. That's an aggravated assault. And if something like that happens to you, you live alone, it happens out in your driveway, with a someone's property of this tenant. I can't prove that this is going on. Is anybody going to do anything about it? Or is it going to be, don't see it, hear it, or smell it, it didn't happen? I've had that said to me by three officers. They don't see it, smell it, or hear it, it didn't happen. Well, that's not Quick true. Um, Captain Dalton, did you hear that question? I did not. <clears throat> so her, her question is, she said she had, I think, a personal experience with some of our officers um, who told her something along the lines of, we didn't see it, hear it, or smell it. We're not going to do anything about it. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. That's actually false. Captain Dalton is in charge of the officers out on the street in uniform. 
So if you have uh, an issue that involves you personally that you would like to address the, the officers with, we're going to do that after this. So these questions are going to be strictly about some of the information that they're dealing with. But if you have a specific incident or issue that you want to address with the officers, you can do that after we're done after the Q&A. In fact, I would love to talk to you when we're done. So if you look at um, the clearance rate uh, percentage, the City of Lloyd Police Department, I think they do a very good job um, compared to the national clearance rate. And I think that uh, is, uh, in large part due to the connection that we have with our community members, because they trust in us and they believe that once they give us the information, we are going to do the proper thing and make the proper arrest. We don't have the 2021 clearance rates yet, uh, because there's a lot more agencies just in the city of Lloyd, and through the FBI, you got to make sure that all the data is correct before they release the clearance rates and the percentages for uh, 2021. <clears throat> Next, we're going to our homicides. We went back to 2018 and to 2022. If you look up there, 2018, we had one homicide. We cleared that homicide. 2019, we had four homicides. Cleared three out of four. 2020. Two cleared one, 21 we cleared uh, two out of four, and then currently in 2022 we have three, and we cleared two of those three. So for a total of a five-year span, we had 14 homicides in the city of Wood, we cleared nine of those for a 64 percent clearance rate. Uh, 2022 FBI national clearance rate is a 49.8 percent. Uh, once again, I'm going to throw the flowers at our community's feet. Um, the connection they have with us and getting past that stigma of they can't talk to the police give us that proper information but I will point out that there's still one in from 2020 that bothers me that there were probably over 80 people in a building and there's 160 set of eyeballs that are still continue to tell us that they did not see anything and that is not probably physically true that anybody can do that so that's one of those things where people need to think about the family that's missing a loved one and how would they feel in that situation if their loved one was taken and there was 80 plus people in a room seeing, seeing what happened and they did not tell and, and, and go forth and tell what happened in that situation. We're still working a lot of these unsolved homicides, but it's unfortunate that crime continues to happen and we can't really put 100% effort into it. Uh, we're trying to build up our staff within the Detective Bureau, so therefore we can allow people to work on some of our cold cases, so therefore we can bring that justice to those families and they can have some type of relief in regards to uh, missing a loved one. So that's something that we're working towards. Uh, like I always tell people, it's a process, and I'm a process person. I can't jump to the end of the process. I wish I could. Uh, but we can't, so we're working on that, figuring out ways to make that better, strengthen that cold case uh, detective group to make sure that we're doing the right things for our community members and making sure people have closure in some of the things that occur. Chief, if I may, I just this is Lori Luther, the city manager. Um, I just want to reiterate how incredibly impressive these numbers are. And this isn't to suggest that we don't need to improve, and as the chief has said, our department is continuing to focus on solving every single one of these crimes. But often I believe the perception is that these numbers are much higher and that the clearance rate is lower. When in reality, we are far better than the national average and the majority of the time, we are able to clear those cases. So yes, there will be constant and continuous improvement in this area, but when you look at these numbers, I think it is different than the perception that the general public often has. And I think also I'd want to piggyback off of that. A lot of people want to know where things are at. Due to an open investigation, we can't release that information sometimes. I know people get frustrated with that, but I can't go and tell them that we are looking at this person because I know how it works. As soon as we tell them, they're gonna to go to Facebook and they're gonna be the CSI detective and they're gonna tell everybody who we're looking at and then that person's going to take off and we're not gonna find that individual. So I think some of that frustration leads to that, us not giving that information, the full information, because we have to protect the integrity of that investigation and make sure that we keep some of the things that we have close to our, our chest and making sure that we are investigating it fully and we can get the proper charges on those individuals. 
So, uh, Captain Dalton is going to come up uh, on this one to talk uh, with me. Uh, the city of Boyd uh, is not unknown, and we have a lot of shots fired, homicides, and shootings in the city of Boyd. So, shots fired is where we find evidence of a shooting in an area where a person or a property has been struck, so we find a shell casing or a bullet fragment in that area. We check the area, do a neighborhood survey, and nothing has been found. A shooting is considered when a person or a property has been struck by that bullet. And then homicide, obviously, is when a person loses their life. So if you look at the map of the city of Boyd, we have a heat map here. Obviously, it is red or yellow. That is a high area for shots fired, homicides, and or shootings. And I'll let Captain Dalton go into that. Did you guys see the yellow area? That's 400 block of Harrison. 400 block of Harrison, I can't give you any great details, but there was an individual that lived there um, that was involved in violent crime in this area. Um, so every time he would return home to his mother's house, he was getting shot at. We're pretty sure that he had a lookout that lived in the apartment complex across the street. So it was every time he showed up, there was a shot fired. Um, so ultimately, we started using our direct control of the chief dog stop, and we targeted two things. First off, I targeted him, the victim that was being shot at, um, because he was on probation. So right away, people just don't shoot at people for no reason, right? I, I've never been shot at. Um, so we know that he's involved in something. So we got a PO hold put on him, and then we had him put on a brace. So we work with probation and parole, get him put on the braces so I know where he's at at all times. So that when the other shootings around the city, because what was happening is he's going around the city shooting at the other people that are shooting at him. So here you have it. So we, we worked pretty diligently for violent crime unit. Um, at the time I was actively a part of the violent crime unit. Um, we set up surveillance on the house, and every time something moved through the area, we were pulling it over or whatever. But ultimately, he, the family ended up getting evicted because I needed to get him out of here. And uh, unfortunately, he had a warrant put out for his arrest when he moved to Indiana. At least that's the last place we know of him. So that hot spot is actually, there's been nothing there. Okay? Um, since he left. And he's living down in Indiana and eventually he'll get picked up and brought back here for his court proceedings. Uh, but that's just kind of one of the ways. So we, tar we, we will target the people that are doing the crimes and if they don't want to talk to us, we're going to get creative and we're going to target them, the victims, because they're not shooting everybody in the city. They're shooting each other. And it's a, when I come across you, I'm going to shoot at you type thing. So it's, it really isn't a... You see the shots fired all over the city? The city's really not as dangerous as that map was, right? Normal citizens don't have to fear that this is going to happen. I come down here with my family when I'm off duty, and we go to the restaurants and things, and nobody's shooting at my car, right? So it, it's people that know each other that are, are into the game, and drugs, and, and that type of, type of game, or game, that it ends up, and it's just when they see each other, which is why there's pockets everywhere. But if you see Area 305, that is the Merrill neighborhood. Uh, Merrill neighborhood's got a lot going on in it. Um, and quite honestly, that's one of the areas that we, we struggle sometimes to get the cooperation with the community. They're very tight knit, and they don't trust us. But, uh, we, we targeted a, uh, a location in that 305 area. We revamped our public nuisance uh, ordinance in the city of Lloyd, and we actually gave a public nuisance to a certain address in a 1600 block of duty. And every time we go there, it's a 600, 600 plus dollar ticket, and it goes up every time we go there. So eventually, every time we get called to that location, and we can identify that the problem is coming from that house, we issue them a citation for that house. The unfortunate thing with that is, the person that owns that house is an elderly person, and it's the relatives and the young people that are in their family that live there. So 
it stinks that we have to give this elderly person a citation every time, but I think sometimes you have to get a hold of your family, and like my mom used to do me when I was a kid and I got out of hand, and you might have to pop them inside the head and say, you need to move from my house. Because eventually one day that house will be owned by the city because they're not going to be able to pay those citations off. So we are revamping and we're, we're using our public nuisance citations. Um, if they're rental properties, then the landlord is the one that's going to be responsible for those citations. So we're taking different avenues and different approaches to combat the shootings and the shots fires that are going on throughout this city. We talked about it earlier with Inspector Saylor, our aggravated assaults. See, once again, is pretty much throughout the entire city uh, where individuals are assaulting each other uh, and, and causing problems within our city. Our robberies are pretty much uh, spread out throughout the city. Those are crimes of opportunity. Burglaries spread out throughout the city. Our auto thefts. Knock on wood, we got a 67 degree day today, so people won't have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, turn the car on, and give people an opportunity to take their vehicle while it's warming up. So hopefully that goes down. But if, once we get that snowfall in May, because we are in Wisconsin, we can go out there and start the car at 4 30 in the morning, uh, leave the city, because you can see it's a prime of opportunity, and it's throughout the entire city where people are just walking around and early morning hours they see a vehicle that's running and they get into that vehicle and they take off. And I would probably say 90% of our auto thefts are our car was rolling up. Yeah. Yes. Especially in uh, January, I think we had 16 or 17 auto thefts and 14 of them were running vehicles. Just like the chief said, either at a gas station, out on the street, or, or in a driveway. And the other three where people left their keys in an unlocked car. And as we progress through the summer, obviously the, the running vehicles will greatly diminish, but the unlocked vehicles will not. There are still almost 70% of our auto thefts. As people, I don't know why we are so trusting in the city of Lloyd, <laughs> but it seems like all of these kids, like she said, they just go around the neighborhood early in the morning, pulling on door handles, they find an open door, they go into the cup holder, and oh, there's some keys, off their off, and now they're driving to Rockford in your car. That's the typical auto theft we see here in Floyd. And it can be prevented because they very rarely break a window. And I'll go further into the unlocked vehicles. Um, the one we had over the weekend, which uh, I'm a gun owner, and I know there's probably people in this room that are gun owners, you don't need to raise your hand. But if you're a gun owner, your gun should be somewhere secure inside of your home. We had an incident over the weekend where an individual had his handguns, six of them, for his protection in his vehicle a block away from his house in a vehicle that was unoperable. Can't be driven. But you have six handguns in a vehicle. How is that going to protect you a block away from your house? So we're working on some things with our, our federal partners because we believe that was a straw purchase. A straw purchase is I can legally purchase a gun and my friends cannot, so I purchase that gun for them, then I give them the gun. And then they say that it was stolen. We had an individual, well, the individual bought the gun in October, and then it was found in a search warrant by Rock County, and then four months later, my guns were stolen. I know where my guns are at in my house. And this is, you know, that's, we, I'd probably say 50% of our, our handgun thefts, rifle thefts, are due to handguns being in cars, unlocked, under the seat, in my armrest, and people are just being negligent as gun owners. And that has to stop. Um, I think as we progress as a police department, as we create our um, Citizens Academy, we'll start to get that into people's brains. If you're gonna be a gun owner, you need to be a responsible gun owner. Because then we'll start looking at you a little bit harder, and taking it up to our DA's office or to the feds, and saying these individuals cannot be legal gun owners because they're the problem with the shootings in the city of Lloyd, with our ghost guns that we have, where you can order parts off the internet without serial numbers, and those guns are being assembled in people's homes, and they're giving them to individuals. So it's very hard to track those guns because they have no serial number on there. 
And if you look here, in the city of Wood, you cannot drive. <laughs> so, what we're going to do is we're going to take everybody outside and we're going to go through uh, the parking lot and see if we drive. We have a very bad problem with driving in the city of Wood. And I, 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 I'm a cell phone user. I don't like cell phones just because my kids can bother me at any time to have money. <laughs> and I, I, they, they, know that, they know what Apple Pay is now, so they're on this Apple Pay. Is. But I think that's one of our biggest problems. You look and you see people just driving with their head down, looking at their phone, not paying attention. Or we have the young individuals that are not able to drive, still in vehicles, and they're driving, obviously, like they have no sense, and they are creating more havoc for us. I know I like my low insurance rates. I'm pretty sure everybody else does. But we have people that are just negligent in, in regards to their uh, behavior while they're driving. Uh, so, so if you look at this map, you got to be asking yourself, what, what are you guys going to do about this? <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a fair question. Um, I'm going to add one, one thing to what the chief said. Speed is usually involved somewhat, some fashion, right? We have speed limits here. I know that as you drive around this community, you'll see that people don't think we've got speed limits, okay? Um, we're working to change that. I will let you know now that um, one of our initiatives is a direct control, but it's also on um, traffic enforcement um, based on driving behavior. We still have our other our other tools for stopping vehicles on people that we, we know are involved in some dirty business, if you will. But our traffic steps, just to give, to give you an idea, from January to February, um, when we implemented this, we went from 222 traffic stops in January to we're right around 700. Um, just under 700, so we're getting it going. Um, it, what I've been telling the, the officers, if it's, if it's speeding and, it, and it's it's over, it's over and they decided because that's the only way that we're going to curb this is by giving them a ticket to, hey, here you go, here's your citation. I'm sorry you were late for work. Maybe you need to leave a little bit earlier type thing. Um, but this will, starting to die down, we hope. Some of our intersections are bad. Um, we are currently in works with DPW and some other, other entities to fix some of those issues. So um, we know this is a problem. We will fix this problem. I don't know if you know this, like I came from state control, so this is, this is kind of near and dear to my heart. Okay. Um, but. Yeah, the only thing is we, we didn't let it wear its hat. <laughs> and we took the hand away. <laughs> Works so hard. Our traffic stops. All right, so if you see the map, um, if you guys saw the light of crime, you saw that in the area of 305, that area was hot for aggravated assaults. It was also hot for vehicle thefts. It was hot. It, 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 it's, it's just hot. We, we know we've got some issues in that area, right? So you see all our traffic stops. If you, you see the pattern there, you're going to see that our traffic stops kind of mirror where our crime is, right? Because I, I want to take care of the, the traffic enforcement part of this, but the violent crime has got to stop. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not going to stop until it stops. So, this is where we're going to be. The chief said after the last homicide, traffic stops are going to go up. We expect the complaints, they can bring the complaints, but here we are. We know that guns and drugs travel by car. It doesn't travel by foot in January, and it doesn't really do it in the summer. Because you got to be able to get away, right? So, go ahead. So, our, our 2022 strategic goals as a police department. Um, I, I said this in my uh, pre pre community meetings. Um, thanks to my command staff for reining me in. I probably had 27 goals for our police department, and you know, they say the chief, we love you, but uh, we're not going to be able to accomplish those goals. So we, we brought them down a little bit to where we want to create, sustain a profession, uh, professionalism and organization, organizational excellence with our police department. I truly believe that within our police department and within our region, Sorry, Rock County and Jamesville and other ones, but I think we have the best police department. Um, we have the probably the most diverse police department. 
not probably we do um, in, in, in the region. Uh, we have great young police officers that are very hungry to do what they need to do. They really want to be involved in the community. Uh, so we're going to create sustained professionalism by giving them proper training, allowing them to be instructors, and then that's going to create that organizational excellence. Um, you know, very too often we think about and we talk about just these sworn police officers. I think we have a great non-sworn representative at our police department, and everybody at the police department knows each, knows each other. We know we know when people are having kids. We know when birthdays are. We know when anniversaries are. And we take care of each other. And I truly think that creates that professionalism and an organizational excellence. <clears throat> Goal number two: create sustained community engagement and community partnerships. Once again, without our community, we'd just be another police department, just out aimlessly wandering around, writing people tickets, not doing things. We're going to be engaging our community. Uh, one of the things we will talk about is this summer, we're going to create two new uh, avenues to engage with our community, especially our young people. Uh, we're going to be having, we, the DPW put in great splash packs over the last couple of years. So one thing I want to do is, is get kids to continue the education throughout the summer. So we're going to be having speeches at the splash pads. So our <coughs> elementary age kids up to our seniors in high schools are going to be tasked, hopefully, by their parents with writing speeches and poems and coming out to the splash pads, having fun with us and, and reading those to us. So we can know who they are. They, they can be the great next minds of the city of Lloyd and they can, they, they can push that knowledge out. That also helps with our young adults in the high school. Some of them may struggle with writing essays, right, for uh, grants, uh, awards, and stuff like that. I was a college student, and when it was time to write an essay, I didn't want to write the essay. So this is going to be able to help them achieve those goals that they have by getting into college or going to a trade school and get into trade. That community partnership. <clears throat> You'll see us uh, walking downtown and going out to other businesses. We have a lot of great small businesses in the city of Lloyd. We want to know who those individuals are, so therefore we can provide them with some of our financial needs that we have as police officers, stopping into businesses, making sure they're okay, stopping into some of our local um, bars during our time, make sure they know who they are. Those individuals have to take their, their teal at the end of the night and take it to a bank. We want to make sure that they have protection when they're doing that because we know that there's people out there that are going to take advantage of a person that's secretly walking to their car or a bank bag. So we want to have those community partnerships and, and, and get out with our community members. And then number three, create and sustain a high performing organization. I think we are we are on that track uh, faster than what I'd like to be, just because then it makes me create another goal. But I think we are a high performing uh, organization. There's a lot of things that we do and that we're going to be doing as a police department that are going to, that's going to make us one of the premier police departments uh, to come and work for. And we continue with our collaboration, uh, holding those community meetings. I know sometimes people can't make it due to uh, work schedules, but we want to be face to face. We want to have those conversations with our community members. I'm a person that likes to talk to a person face to face. Thank you for Zoom, uh, Teams, and all those good things, but I'm a person that wants to feel that energy from our community members, feel the energy from people, because then we can know how, how we need to attack the problems. We do a great job on our Facebook page. There's some things that we're going to uh, be creating uh, that uh, Inspector Stigler talked to one of our sergeants uh, yesterday, uh, posting on our website uh, to make sure people can get the proper information that they need. I know sometimes we get a lot of uh, calls in regards to what about, what's our policy, what's our policy. I think we need to do a better job of letting our community members know was that two years ago, three years ago, we put all our policies on our web page. So everybody had, you know, uh, a couple years ago, uh, due to the unfortunate event with George uh, Floyd, you know, the, the can't wait, one of the biggest things was putting your policy, especially your use of force policy, on your website. We were a year or two advanced on that. We had already put that out there for our community members to have. So our policies are there. There's sometimes it may be down because we have to update our policy every three years, and then you have a set of eyes that read it, like, oh man, you misspelled this word, or this doesn't make sense, and we go in and we change it. But our policies are out there. Utilization of our crime stoppers. Uh, 
know, Captain Molly, you talked about that. I think that uh, really great thing to do with uh, Crime Stoppers. So Crime Stoppers, we have a great partnership with uh, Crime Stoppers. And it gives people an avenue to actually call anonymously, right? So if you have a tip on something, you can call, you can go online, and you can get that tip. It's really good because then you get that information because you may have some information, and it might be that just a little tidbit that we need, which may be like ah, someone else priority pulls. That's why we always tell everyone we need as much information as possible. And then the nice thing about that is that even though we don't know who you are, we can then respond back and say, hey, would you mind us following up and actually talk to you? Because then we can try to validate and get some more deeper information. But the amount of success that we've had with Crime Stoppers is huge. And you'll see it on the buses, you'll see it plastered everywhere in the schools. Um, please tell everyone that if you don't get information and you don't want to come and talk to a cop in person, at least call Crime Stoppers. At least give us that opportunity to have that little bit of information that we may not have before because that may be the case. Yes. 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 yes, you're not as we call it Crime Stoppers. You get, you get a number in case, in case you make an arrest and you want to get paid. Yeah. You get rewards for, for doing that at least two other arrests. As a member of the Crime Stoppers board, we really like paying people. <laughs> Uh, we, we created our hotline number uh, back in January, but we had that uh, unfortunately 81 hours. Um, that's been very beneficial to us, just like Crime Stoppers. One thing is, like Mark said, they like giving out money. If we get some information from our hotline number and it's successful, we will reach back out to that person and say, hey, call Crime Stoppers because you're going to be rewarded. We, we can pat you on the back, but we can't give you $1,000. So first question was, uh, how are we going to measure our goals and how are we going to say we're successful in that? These are new goals and what we're doing is we're tracking them now and say this is our this is where we're at in 2022. How can we be better in 2023 and going forward? And how many communities did we attend? Um, so the officers are going to be responsible for tracking those and we're going to be able to get those out of our, our records management system. It's called Spillman. So they, they're going to punch out they're going to clock out into an area, and we're going to be able to track that. And then we're going to say, this is how many we went to last year. That's either B or C that in 2023. The second one is, actually, this year, um, we used to vet out to Dr. Brian T. Marks at Morton House uh, College for our uh, equity training and our implicit bias training. And one of the things I thought about is I'm a community person and I said you know we have a great person in the city of Lloyd that does that same training why are we having a person from Atlanta come in and train our police officers that don't know our police officers so I sat there and I said I'm going to call on Mark Perry to provide the training for our Lloyd police department moving forward because once again with community action that helps us build that community that helps us understand who Mark is our officers know who Mark is, and then when something unfortunate happens, let's just face it, there, there, there will be another officer involved shooting. Mark can say, no, I, I, I dealt with these, this police department. This is who this police officer is. This is what they talk about. We can call Brian T. Mark and say, hey, you remember two years ago on Zoom, you trained us, and you remember this officer? And he's like, yeah, I think so. But now we have a community member that's very, very, very involved in the community that can say yes, the Boy Police Department is doing these things with their uh, implicit bias training, their diversity and inclusion. This is what we do. <clears throat> Speaking of our diversity and inclusion, I think uh, in 2017, when I got promoted to lieutenant, uh, my job was to recruit individuals to come work for the Boy Police Department. And I looked at it at that time, we had four African American officers, we have 12 now. We had five female officers, we have nine now. We had four Hispanic officers, we have nine now. 
We never had a full Native American police officer. We hired our first one in January. So we, when we say that we want to be inclusive in our police department, we do. We just don't send a flyer out. I mean, I traveled to St. Louis, to Kennedy King, Malcolm X, Wilbur Wright College in Chicago multiple times because if you show up one time, they'd be like, oh, he's just trying to recruit me. But if you show up five, six, seven times, they'd be like, this guy, this guy is serious. We went throughout the state of Wisconsin. We went to Western Illinois, which is one of the top five criminal justice uh, universities in the country. And we hired probably 10 or 11 from Western Illinois uh, from diverse backgrounds. Uh, that, that's who we are, and that's what we're doing uh, for our police department. Chief, if I may, I can really geek out on the performance measurement side of things, so I'll spare you the time, but one of the outcome measurements that we're trying to get to, too, is, you know, it's great if we go to X number of community meetings, but if we're not building these relationships and people aren't feeling more trust and willing to share more information so we can clear more crimes, then ultimately it's not achieving the purpose we need it to. So we're looking at our clearance rates as well to look at, you know, with this increased community engagement side, are we seeing a direct tie to the information and the witnesses needed um, or the, the tips that are needed in order to close those crimes, crimes and move on? Um, early on, we had, um, long before Chief Sales was, was in place, um, we had some issues with um, sexual crimes. And because, uh, in my opinion, we got a whole lot better about investigating and closing those crimes, we actually saw an increase in the reported crimes, but I believe that it was due to the fact that there was an increased level of trust in being able to report a crime and to know that it would be followed through to its end. So we have to be super careful about going down the slippery slope of is this you know, directly correlated to the outcome and, and really dig into the data to make sure that um, what we're, measure, we're measuring the right things and that we're adjusting based on the data we're getting so that uh, we can you know, ultimately get the best responses we need. But it's always obviously an art form um, in and of itself. Um, but I think that uh, we have a great deal of historical data that we can kind of do comparisons moving forward and see, all right, are we moving the dime? Jimmy, you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I kind of want to piggyback on what Lori said. I think it's important when we're, when we're talking about those relationships in the community that you build those relationships with the people who are closest to those communities you're trying to work with. So my question is, what are your plans to engage with those grassroots organizations that are already working with those at-risk youth that are closest to the people in the community that you're trying to work with? Because have you already started though, building those relationships? And what are those organizations? Like the grassroots organizations that are all in on the ground, like a Rojas Fox and Vienna, or a Club Fontanetto. Those types of organizations that are all, that already have the gear with those youth. So those types of organizations. Yep, so a lot of those things I've, I've personally done myself. And now it's the being dad and saying, you're going to do this now because I can't be everywhere. <clears throat> we, we spoke with Rojas Boxing, um, trying to uh, help with some funding from them, not from the police department, but teaching them ways to get out and utilize grants and funding that they can get, and having officers actually go into the gym with them, uh, talking about proper ways to uh, deal with their, their, their stress that they're dealing with. And instead of picking up a gun, Go to the gym and box. Go to the gym and work out. Uh, go down to the YMCA. Go to Planet Fitnesses and stuff like that. Talk about that. Um, I have a meeting with uh, 608 kids where we're going to start sending officers over there after school hours, working with the kids, letting them know who they are. One of the biggest things I always tell my officers is, guess what? You don't have to wear the uniform when you go there because then that's gonna be able to create that connection a lot better. That's one thing I used to do. I used to not wear my uniform and kids would gravitate toward me more 
And then they would say, well, what do you do for a living? I was a police officer, and they tried to run, and I grabbed <laughs> you know, You're going to sit here and talk to me. You were talking to me the first 10 minutes, you're going to continue talking to me. But it's, it's building those connections with them. Working with the Boys and Girls, girls Club. Going over there and talking to those kids. They have the teen nights, I think it's a Thursday at like 5.30 to like 8 o'clock at night. Working with them. I'm on the board for a lot of those things. But now it's getting our officers to go out and do that. Uh, developing that free time for them with our hiring processes so they can have that time to go out and uh, talk to the kids and be involved with those kids. You have to look at the city of what we go to a, an average of about 160 calls a day. <clears throat> One of the biggest things is we need to get our community members to understand that it's not my job to come into your house and tell your son or daughter they cannot play PlayStation. Right. But we get those calls. Right. That is not a police matter. <laughs> right. My kid didn't want to eat my own milk. You should have put raisins in it. Okay. I, <laughs> we, 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 we can't go to those calls. Those are the calls we get. And that ties up our officers from doing those events that's going no, to. I, I guess what my question really is, is if there going to be some kind of a, collabor a, a true collaboration with those organizations where there's this understanding where all the groups have kind of come together and there's this agreement and understanding that the work is going to be done together with these groups. I haven't spoken to all the groups okay. yet. That's something that we should get together and start doing right. sooner rather than later. Thanks. I think she had her. Um, I can't imagine anybody not knowing about crime stoppers. So why were there 30 or more witnesses uh, outside Memorial High School at the basketball game, and they refused to talk to the police about the famous shooting. I think, you know, looking back on that situation, that's a traumatic event, and I think a lot of people needed time to process. And I think after the, the, the kids processed it, and they talked to professional social workers and things of that nature at the schools, those kids realized that our friend was murdered for nothing, and it's our job to help bring him to justice, and they did that within time. So it was very unfortunate that 24 hours later, nobody, no one said anything, but when you pull yourself back and say that's a traumatic event, and they need time to process that because they are children, and they really don't fully develop their frontal cortex until 25 years old, and now we get that, and they spoke with the school, and the school said this is what you should do. This is what you should do. And they continued to hear that, and they did it. Um, well, I'm Audie Buchanan, I'm a school social worker at Lloyd Learning Academy, and the student that was killed that night was, was one of our students. And many of his friends attend that school as well, and the first school day, because that happened on a Friday night, Saturday night, sure. so then the following Monday, the kids were coming to us as staff members, and so many of us sat down and we made the anonymous call to the hotline number, not to Crime Stoppers. We made it to the hotline number. We sat with those kids, and I can't even count how many kids had us do that. And they told, and some of the kids maybe were just telling the same information over and over again, but they did. They came forward, and they did their job. And they trusted us enough at the schools to know that we would help them do that without ratting them out to like, oh, so-and-so's paddling, oh, so-and-so's being a snitch. Like that went right out the window. And one of the biggest driving factors for getting so many of those kids to speak up was the ones that were closest to the one that was killed told others, he doesn't want this handled in the streets. He wants this handled properly. He was not a kid who was out in the streets shooting guns and selling drugs like that. He was in the house all the time. He went to a basketball game and got in the wrong place at the wrong time. He wasn't even the target. And they reinforced with their friends, don't handle this in the street, do the right thing, talk to the police. And I am so proud of them for doing that because they stepped away from the don't snitch code and they did the right thing. And because the hotline was set up and they were able to do it anonymously, it made it a lot easier because then nobody knew who was who was turning in and who was saying what. So, and I did have something I wanted to say about the relationships. We, let's get to, I, let me finish this slide. Yeah, that's just okay, so well, it, was, it was in support of the police building the relationships. Mm -hmm. 
they do a lot to try to build relationships, but what helps even more is for, for the organizations, the kids, the families, the community members that already have a relationship with one or more officers to talk about that and encourage their circles and their other family members to trust the same people, and that's how the relationships get started. So our response to a lot of this is to continue to build our trust and transparency to increase numbers of residents off the police. Um, our community connection, non-enforcement contacts, our officers being able to come in on overtime, once again, not being in their uniform, going to a basketball game, uh, talking to the kids, putting these special things that kids accomplish out on our Facebook page, and just having that connection with them in a non-enforcement uh, contact. Our direct control, we received grants uh, to assist us with that. Uh, we're going to be a data-driven, uh, intelligence-led uh, police department. We have a crime analyst, full-time crime analyst at our police department. She does a lot of great things for us to show us where the crime is occurring yet, and we, where we can uh, put that direct control. <clears throat> One of the things that we have that myself and uh, Captain Bob talk about is we have cameras and license plate readers uh, in the city of Boyd. Uh, what that is, is I, I just want everybody to understand, it is not when you see that yellow light and you zoom through it. We are not using it for that. It is for um, our violent crimes. It is for our hidden runs where people are uh, injured significantly. And we can get a license plate off of that vehicle and we can put it into a database and they can ping in different areas. One of the things is I'm very good friends with uh, Chief Red down in Rockford Police Department and they have it throughout Rockford. And we've been looking at the same camera system to allow us to connect with their camera system. So therefore, when we put a license plate into our system, and if it goes down to Illinois, it will ping off of one of their license plate readers, and it'll let us know where that vehicle's at. Uh, we were successful in that in January when we had a couple of our vehicle thefts. Uh, we put that license plate in there within 10 to 15 minutes. Lo and behold, 30 minutes later, it's pinging in Rockford. And they were able to arrest six, Three or, three or six individuals out of stolen vehicles by doing that. So those cameras that are going to be strategically placed throughout our city um, in areas where vehicles are high traffic and they're going through there, we're going to be able to get those license plates. It's helped, it's helped us solve three crimes already this year um, by just having a few in our city. We're going to be able to post that up. I'll let Captain Mala talk about that a little bit more. So the cameras and license plate readers, you know, we always talk about, you know, everything that we've done up to this point was really put by cops on the dots trying to prevent the crime from occurring. We always say, would you rather us stop a burglary from occurring at your house or come and pay for the report? Probably stop it, right? Beforehand. But if an unfortunate thing happens and a burglary occurs in your house, we need to have those tools to be able to solve those crimes. That's where the cameras and license plate readers really come into play that we have now all this great technology that we can actually try to work and try to solve more violent crimes. It's a great tool. And what it also does is it allows us to make sure that you guys understand why we're using it. So the International Association of Chiefs of Police, you know, they tell pretty much the Chiefs, hey, here's best practices for policies. So we kind of paid that and that's one thing we're doing right now is that we're you know, sharpening our policy so that we have a good policy in place that pretty much tells everyone that, hey, the reason why these are in place is for you know, criminal investigations, those serious accidents, so that the public doesn't understand or so you don't think that we're out there trying to watch everything that you guys do and you know, like they see on TV and stuff. It's about having that good connection that if we have a crime, we can pop up on um, the computer and see the car, get the license plate, get it sent out. Um, the program that the Chief's talking about, if we're looking for one of our violent criminals, the one that um, Captain Dalton was talking about, and we know he's in a vehicle, we can put that plate in the system, and if everyone's on the same system, if they go by that, boom, we get a notification, pay for at this location, and then we can make an arrest. Hopefully make the community safer. Ultimately, the whole goal is of the cameras and the license plate readers, this is made for you safe. And we do that because we're gonna hopefully reduce crime and we will be like, maybe I shouldn't keep doing all this. So ultimately that's that's the goal. Uh, what can you all do to help? Talk to our officers. Uh, I don't see too many officers that are disrespectful or rude to our community members. 
Uh, get to know your area officers. We're going to really push our officers uh, doing foot patrols uh, in neighborhoods so they can get to know their residents uh, on a first name basis. Um, so when you see them walk around, don't run back to the house. Possible. Uh, be my partners with the police department to collaborate and make in safe neighborhoods. Uh, call in incidents. Don't rely on the, that someone else called it in. The more information, the better. Uh, you can have a vital piece of information for us. So we got about 15, 20 minutes uh, for some questions. If anybody else has questions, um, once again, like I said, we, we have our command staff here. Uh, we have one of our sergeants here. Uh, we have four out of our six new officers in the back. So you can start asking them questions. They've been in the academy 10 weeks now. 10 weeks, eight weeks left. Uh, so it's a long time. Once again, I think a lot of people sometimes, when I used to stress myself out when I uh, look at Facebook, a lot of people say, that, oh man, a hairdresser works about, has more training than a police officer. They go to the police academy for 18 weeks, 720 hours, and at minimum, through the police department, we probably train an additional every year. I would guesstimate probably 70 hours, 80 hours, our cops. That's the minimum. I'm going whole ball on that. Uh, we, we put on great scenario training over the last two weeks to get our officers better prepared uh, for some of the things that we've seen that's been a trend throughout the uh, country. Okay, any questions? Remember, keep your questions directed towards the one chief and his officers will present. If you have a specific issue or concern about a specific incident involving you, if you have a friend, a friend or a family member, please address that with them afterwards. But any questions in general? Yes. Yes, Chief. Um, there's been a lot of talk in the last year about saying that sometimes these are called to an incident that concerns somebody with mental problems. And is there a response that the Hawaii Police Department either has made or would like to make? And do you find that you wish that these calls, maybe some of them can go to another place instead of to the police? Great question. Uh, we're going to talk about mental health next week, but I'll, I'll lead into it a little bit. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to have our one of our state certified trainers and national trainers come up, Sergeant Linder. Um, we, our entire police department goes through crisis intervention training, uh, which is a 40 hour uh, week training. And I would probably say every officer that is not on the street right now has gone through CIT and we have another class coming up. Yep. So, it, you were the question answer, right? Make sure I put my attention card. So as a whole, the City of Boyd Police Department has taken a lot of initiatives to be proactive um, we started a program that's actually countywide back in 2017, where um, you could probably Google it and see some little history about it. Um, we flag people with mental health illnesses. We don't do it to shame them, and we don't do it to try and categorize or title people. But it gives our officers an opportunity to be able to say, hey, this person has a diagnosis which may be causing the display that I'm seeing on this call. Maybe this isn't criminal in nature, right? We got bad guys and we have people who suffer from mental health, and then we have people who have a really bad day who are having a mental health episode, and people who happen to have mental health issues who chose to steal from the grocery store, right? So we have this whole camp. Uh, but we've done a really good job since 2017 making sure that we are identifying people who may display differently than an average so that we can tend to them appropriately. Um, a large majority of our community that suffer from mental health issues who are aware of our flagging program are supportive and grateful for it. We have a lot of parents who call and I'll chat with them and they'll say, hey, this is my child's diagnosis. What can I do so that you can handle my child appropriately? And we say, well, give me a rundown on what works for coping skills or something. And then we can add information so not only do our officers see this, our dispatchers are flagged by it. So if you call in and you say, my son, Mike Jones, is, is having an issue, he's throwing things in the roadway, I need you to come keep him sick. Oh, Mike Jones gets put into the call, dispatch will alert the officers, check your notes. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to know that there may be something else that's causing someone to behave in a particular way. Um, in addition to that, the chief hinted towards our um, CIT program. 
We have week-long training that is sponsored by NAMI, which is the National Alliance of Mental Illness of Rock County for our county. And we're able to put officers through every year for a week-long block of training specifically dedicated to mental health. Now, obviously it would be great if we could spend a week doing that for all officers, but it's a nice good baseline so that as officers grow, they have a new skill set and a more advanced skill set so that they can kind of decipher the difference between law enforcement and mental health. We understand people are going to call us when things don't look right, and we try and do our best to make sure we can put people in the right way. Right, right now, we don't have a social worker tied to our police department. That's like in my list of 50 to get to, um, but that's something that, I mean, we've talked about that for years. Um, having that person that's a certified expert, because we're not that certified expert. We have training, but we're not an expert. We want to make sure we have an expert form of those calls with us. And we say, this is not a police matter. Here you go. And we can do it. Thank you so much. Any questions? Oh, I had a question. This is from a resident. I was, and I don't know if the lady's here tonight, but I was at an event, the share of the red, a sharing of the red event um, this morning. And the question that she had, I don't know if she's here, she needed to come in, but she asked, uh, and I know you can't get out a lot of information, she says there was an incident on H Street and wondering, you know, uh, she was very concerned for her safety. And so wanting to know, is that, did that happen or? I, I would have, I, don't, I would need more detail. Yeah, it's just that I, I know she couldn't be here tonight. She had to go to a game, but that was one of her concerns. She said she lived on the west side of town for many years and just very concerned about her safety. And I know that at the last, there was a, you did a, a presentation to the Greater Boy Economic Development Corporation and you, show, you shared how um, we don't have to be afraid of walking downtown because a lot of these incidents are isolated. So that's what I tried to convey to the lady, but I don't know. Yep. A person that gets shot knows who shot him. Person, that's, that's just how it works sometimes. Those individuals know each other. And we haven't seen any crimes where a person has been targeted because they have this or they have that. It is people that know each other and they're, they're, they're shooting each other, striking, hitting each other, aggravated assaults with each other because of something someone's done. Um, I don't fear a person, person running around here just shooting at individuals recklessly. Uh, but the 8th Street incident, I would need more details and like specifically dates and times when it occurred. So therefore we can look at that and see what, what they talk about. We had that question. She was going to come tonight and had a game and that's why I brought it up. I was like, I'm not really familiar with that. And so I know she really was concerned. More, like she said, you know, there's been incidents happening on the west side of town. But you showed us where there's areas where it's in 305 and some of the other areas where it's occurring. But she was just concerned. Said she had her house, was a homeowner there for many years and not had these kind of things occurring and she was afraid for her safety. So I tried to assure her that our police department is working to, to try to deter those kind of things from occurring. Well, if you talk to her, let her let her know, reach out to us so that we can know what specific incident she's talking about. Okay, we'll do it, got it. Any other questions? Okay, you talked about some older man or woman that had this rental house where there's all this relatives who are doing all this bad stuff and you ticket them five six hundred dollars and then on up are they getting paid I, I would have to look and check I, I, once we write the ticket i, I oh. kind of go about the business because <laughs> every day is an adventure i, I just wonder <laughs> other questions I just, more it's not really a question but more of a comment and just how um, great the working relationship is between the police department and the school district of Beloit um, and continuing that close communication and everything that happens and going back and forth um, and especially the work that they did uh, and Sergeant Linders working on the SRO contract um, which uh, not like rumors have it wasn't that we could just sign an, a, a, an agreement to extend it the contract actually ended and, and it was rewritten to do that um, the agreement we have now is much stronger much better on both sides uh, and so i think that program will even grow more more influential with the students within the building than it has been before 
Um, and I just really want to say publicly how great that relationship has been and continues to be. So thank you. I'll, I'll give all the credit to Sergeant Lender, Lieutenant Elrod, Missy Beavers, and Ryan, the head of security over there at the school. They, they're the ones that worked on it. I just have to look, look it over a few times. They, they did a great job on that, that collaboration. Other questions? We got a lot of police officers here. Yeah. Please get to know them. Any other chief in your last comments? No, uh, thank you for everything that you, you all do for us. Um, you know, we, we, we're truly trying hard. Uh, our, our goal is to truly create that connection with our community. Uh, we're, not, we're not just saying it, we're actually going out and doing it. Uh, so when you see us, or wave at us, we're going to wave back, get ready for our officers to be out on, uh, on foot throughout the neighborhoods. Um, watch our Facebook page, we'll send something out for the splash, the speeches at the splash pad, and the uh, the conversation about a campfire uh, that's coming out this summer. So then we'll be having that, that connection with each other. People can uh, talk to us about it. But I will say one thing, I'm gonna have the recent pieces for the, uh, the scores. If you are a just chocolate person, then you might have to <laughs> So before we go, I just wanted to, first of all, I want to thank Chief. Thank the officers for being here this evening. I do want to encourage people, if you have a community event, especially that involving youth, reach out to the police department and invite them. We have the PD into our events all the time. They regularly visit Maryland Community Center. They regularly visit our youth and youth community action. I have a great video of Captain Mullins dancing with um, a group of kids at one of our black, black parties a couple years ago. We talked about a rhythmless nation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you reach out, they will come. So part of that, we can't just expect the police officers to, also good to know when things are happening. We have to reach out to them and let them know when events are occurring, when community things are happening, when they have those opportunities for engagement. There's never been a time in the past several years that I've invited them to an event that they haven't shown up and shown up in large quantities. So we need to make sure we're doing that outreach and engagement too so our youth can have those interactions with them in those times that aren't in crisis. Also, thank our school counselor for being here this okay. evening. Really appreciate it. Really One last thing just related to that. I don't think we all realize in this community how much that shooting at the high school impacted our young people. So if you're connected to a person, a young person in this community that was, whether they were there that night or not, it impacted a lot of our kids. So, and we have not really dealt with that and some of them haven't had a chance to deal with the trauma behind that. So if you have an opportunity to engage with some young people in our community, please do so. And please steer them towards school counselors, towards other adults who can help and support because none of our kids expect to go to a basketball game and have that happen. So. And if you need a list of mental health care providers in the community, I can supply that. So. Thank you. And with that, we'll let you say thank you. Thanks for being here this evening. Please, if you have more questions, concerns, issues, please feel free to talk to our officers. Um, if you're interested in information about community action, I have a whole bunch of staff here about stuff we're doing too. So, but thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you.